Sophie King Cool here with Ryan from Julian Came. How you doing, man? Uh, I'm doing uh, weirdly. Um, it's uh, it's been a been a crazy time. Um, we've had to obviously with the rest of the entire planet sort of rejuggle our entire world and business and you know uh, cancel and and reschedule tour dates that you know we honestly don't even know if we'll be able to make you know happen even though they're rescheduled it's just a definitely a time of of craziness oh um, i agree with you 100 percent. yeah it's 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 tough but you know through it all we managed to kind of turn the fact that we're not going on tour into launching a patreon launching a new merch store and we're fast forwarding our new album uh, trauma echoes and we have created up a streaming environment in the studio so that we could perform interact with fans um, do all that good stuff that you kind of need to do and it turns out the fans really really want the content they really want to watch this stuff right especially right now and they've responded really well they, they, they bought out our merch store um, the patreon went through the roof um, yes we're about to launch the Trauma Echoes campaign, and that will probably, knowing our fans, that'll be a really, really well received, you know, big deal. And then we'll basically start streaming um, the Trauma Echoes work from my studio, you know, pretty much immediately, and uh, you know, work on work on promoting Harmonic Disruptor to the rest of the world, and let the, the singles do their jobs, and let the album do its job, and you know, hopefully tour will come back and um you know all that good stuff will will start to come back around again now being a musician this must be a stressful time all the way around i mean for you you go ahead 2020 comes around you're ready to start things off you start putting out singles you get your tour set up and then there's all kinds of investing that goes in that from getting the production set up to getting the crew hiring the tour bus getting everything going Oh, we've got we've got ten thousand dollars of merch just sitting in a warehouse. I mean, we've got you know with the dates printed on it, <laughs> so it's really tough. And then you know we thought that it was going to be um, you know spring summer, so we've got a bunch of sleeveless shirts, you know, which now are they going to sell in the winter? I mean, it's it's so disruptive. I mean, we had you know people hired, we had everything that you just said, <laughs> you know, so it's. It's really, it's really bad. And on top of that, we also own uh, brick and mortar restaurants here in California. Um, it's something that we kind of accidentally started to do and became successful in it. And um, most of them are closed now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there's not a, there's, there hasn't been a dime of government money that was promised that, um, that, uh, you know, it's supposed to come to people like us, like business owners and, you know, then the self-employed musician people, the 1099 guys, uh, you know, the guys that do what we do in the entire entertainment industry. Um, um, I haven't seen any uh, place where you can sign up for unemployment. <laughs> you, know <what> I mean? <laughs> you know, when you when you sign up for unemployment, because right now it's kind of an emergency, right? Like we lost 100 percent of our income. And we have outstanding bills because we had to pay for the tour. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's really, a, it, it's a scary time. It's, you know, but thank God for the fans because we launched these new things. You know, we launched the Patreon, we launched um, the new web store and we're going to do this new campaign. And honestly, they spoke so loudly with their, with their wallets and their support that it, it helped us from not disappearing, you know, over, over this last month. Oh, I mean, thank God that they're going out there and doing that. I mean, right now what it is, I think people just really want to connect with the bands. They want to see the, the content and just get some kind of release from being locked in the house. I mean, how long can you look at four walls? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been, it's been, uh, eye opening to see, you know, streaming music actually kind of go down. And the video consumption streaming and the interactive really going to the roof. And so we jumped on that really quickly. And the fans have been really, really cool about it. And they are, they are sick of being cooped, cooped up. They're sick of it. <laughs> 
And I think, I think from what I'm seeing, it seems like America is getting a little sick of it. Um, you know, the devastation that this has caused makes me, I mean, this just sounds like a cruel thing, but I, I wonder if the, if the cure was worse than, than, than the disease. Right. I know it's, uh, it's a, it's a scary thing. And, and, you know, I know of people who have passed from coronavirus and I, I know of, I know of, you know, uh, tragic outliers where people that you wouldn't normally think would die from it, that died from it. I, but, but, but they're outliers, you know, in other words, that isn't the majority. That's not really what's happening. And it's just, it's scary to think that we just shut our nation down, you know, um, just shut it the fuck down. <laughs> you know, and I, I, I'm very scared about what suicide rates are going to look like over the next year when people who were perfectly healthy lost everything and they don't know how to handle that. And uh, I mean, I think they're already talking about it. And people who are skipping, you know, needed surgeries because they don't want to go to emergency rooms. I mean, the unintended consequences are incredible. They're just incredible. You know, oh. and it's just, it's, it's sad. Now, what people don't realize is that as a musician, I mean, this is hard on you for the fact of the the income that you make is majority from touring. Now, you're locked yeah. in. You have no idea when you can get back on the road. I know you guys have dates set, and that's just we do lock them in, you know? Yeah, it's, all, it's all conjecture, right? You know, it, it's, it's, it's very scary. Um, and then keep in mind, when we get these dates set and everyone's planning on it, everyone's hoping that June, you know, we're going to be able to go out and do, you know, that, that it just can't be held down this long. Um, but we're going to, like, Edema is going to spend the capital. They're going to, we're going to capitalize the tour, <laughs> you know? And then if it doesn't happen, I mean, it's just, I, I, it's just incredible. <laughs> it's incredible. You know, it's a very scary thing. Now, but, um, when you're <laughs> getting ready to, to go on the road, how are you preparing for yourself? I mean, is it going to be, you know, are you going to perform with gloves and mask on? What are you, what are you going to do? No, I'm going to just be careful about hugging people and shaking hands and all that kind of good stuff. And I'm going to, I'm going to trust that, um, this, this virus typically does not kill people like me. Um, I don't have, uh, I'm not 65 or and over with CPOD and, uh, asthma and underlying conditions. I'm a pretty healthy guy. And I just assume that I either have had it or I'm going to get it. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going crazy about the whole thing. Um, being a lead singer, I've always washed my hands a lot, especially after interacting with fans. It's not because I think the fans are dirty. It's because I know that everyone's some kind of sick and I can't get sick. Um, I never have touched my face because again, I'm a singer and I don't want to get a, a flu or a cold while I'm on tour. Or, or any time because I make a live, you know, even the, when I'm not on tour, I'm still singing in the studio, you know what I mean? I'm doing a lot of talking because I run a lot of our businesses. So, um, I think that, that I hope that everyone kind of does that. You know, I hope that there's a lot more hand washing because I definitely see when I travel the world and I travel the country and I even play in a band with, you know, different with Adina and Julian K. And I, I, you know, I see people's levels of not giving an F about washing up <laughs> you know they all know to stay away from me <laughs> because you know they don't want to get the singer sick but i mean you should treat everyone like they're the, they're the singer and you know i think that you should be wary of going and visiting your grandparents you know send them an amazon echo um video and talk to them that way and you know th i think that we should be protecting the people that are at the highest risk but i'm not going to go around the country and freak out about this thing because um you know I, I i know of more people that have had it that have barely had any symptoms than than the few people i know of that have actually died so would you say things like meet and greet are going to be put on hold for quite a bit no i'm going to do them but we're just going to put rules you know just have rules just say hey we to meet and greet these are the rules we're going to be there's not going to be any hugging and there's not going to be any handshaking for at least for, for this year, but we're going to sign all your stuff and we'll talk and all that kind of stuff, but we'll, 
there's just not going to be contact, you know, before I pretty much make it a pr- pretty big point of going and hugging, you know, everyone that, that came to the meet and greet and all that kind of stuff. So I think that that's, that's what I would do. You know, what we're going to be allowed to do, I have no idea, but, you know, VIP is a big part of tour revenue. You know, you come right. and, and the fans, at least our fans, they really want to support us like that. Like our fans do this stuff, not, not just because, oh, I got to meet them. And a lot of them have done meet and greet nine or 10 times and they do it because they care about the band. And they know that that's what puts gas in the vehicle. They know that that's what, you know, they're just super cool. You know, I, I don't know how we have such a group of amazing fans, but we really seem to have an incredible group of fans. And I think that they'll, that, you know, there might be a face mask thing. You know, what we might be coming out with masks. We might be get, you know, they might need to come to shows with masks. Um, whatever. But I think that you can still... You know, I mean, funny enough, I'm still going out and talking to all my neighbors and, you know, not any different than a meet and greet. You know, we're just not shaking hands and giving each other hugs. So, I I don't know. I'm really not as, I'm not as personally, I'm not as freaked out by this thing. I think that, like I said, I assume that I just have it. You know, I just assume that I have it. I don't want to give it to someone. And I take those precautions because it works both ways. But I'm not going to stop living my life. And, I'm, and if they let me, I'm not going to not tour and cower in my house and, you know, all that kind of shit. Now, are you preparing yourself to see if venues are going to maybe do half capacity, if they're going to have like a structured area where it's going to be social distancing sections where the fans are spread out? I definitely am wondering what that's going to look like. Um, and I just don't know. Um, but I really, at some point, I think that the country and the states are going to have to make a decision that how much life and economy, and because I'm not, I'm not saying money, money is a part of it, but how much life are we going to give up? And what do we get in return? You know, these venues are going to go away. You know, and that's going to be more devastation, more families, you know, destroyed, more bankruptcies, more suicides, you know, more foreclosures, more. I mean, it's just at some point we've got to, you know, at least decide that, look, okay, we're going to do three quarters capacity or something and everyone where masks and that's the best we can do (laughs) you know i hope i hope someone i hope that decision is made but right now um you know all i know is that you know i we're talking to the whiskey about doing like a a a live streaming show there for our fans and because it's all wired up with black magic cameras and all kind of stuff and so far from what i heard from the whiskey was like yeah just practice safe social distancing you know so i think they want to do it they're just like, yeah, just make sure that you guys follow the rules, whatever that means. So I think that as things get loosened up, I, I just think that I, I think that you, you know, people are just <laughs> they're just going to want to go to shows. <laughs> so I, I don't know. I don't know what it's going to mean. I, I'm, I'm definitely very cautiously optimistic. I hope that it's going to mean that we're able to go out, but I just don't know. You know, if, it, if it's half full rooms. You know, then I don't know how the tours can do it because how do you do merch with right. with a half full room? Now, so is, it's scary. Is the uh, the new metal tour still a uh, go then with you and Power Man Five Thousand Saliva? Yeah, that's that's booked. That's that's booked. And and from what I'm hearing, and I do talk to our agent, you know, every day uh, or not every day, but regularly. Um, what I'm being told is that it's, you know, it's really big. It's, it's big shows that are really done for the year and that all the small venues are planning on, um, on doing shows. And I'm sure they're going to go out of their way <laughs> to make, you know, I'm sure they're going to make it like the line's going to be distant. Maybe able to do three fourths capacity. I'm sure maybe they'll require masks. I, who fucking knows? They're going to do whatever they can to protect their liability. But um, I think the small venues are like, dude, let's go. Let's fucking go. So those shows are not canceled. 
and we rebooked all the birthday massacre Julian K shows um, through the winter, which is actually you know not good for us because traveling in the winter is really dangerous. But you know when you when you when you lose two hundred thousand fucking dollars, um, you you need you know we kind of have no choice. We have to go out and and play. You know we we obviously want to play, but um, you know the losses are just like wow. You know if we just don't do it at all this year, that's just going to be like. That's just going to be horrible, and I and I don't see any, you know, despite what I hear the president say, and despite all the the trillions of dollars that just got spent and gobbled up, um, I don't know anyone in our world that's gotten a dime of support. You know, it's really bad. <laughs> you know, yeah, no one's really talking about how musicians are going to get any kind of funds. For- for this, I mean, like we talked about earlier, I mean, touring is, it's a yep. lot of money. So people don't think yep. about all those expenses that are there. Yep. And, and what about the, you know, there's all the people that work on the tours that aren't famous. Right. In that group. group. And they're doubly fucked, you know, and it's like, they can't just create a Patreon like I did. And by the way, that's no small order. It's not like I just sat down one afternoon and was like, I'm going to make a fucking Patreon. You know, it's, it's, it's work like you have to create a new fucking online business that people that's interesting enough for people to subscribe to and do it so it takes like talent skill and thought and all that kind of crap but really no one would fucking do it if they didn't like our band and our music but what about like our merch guy what about our stage guys what about like the lighting guy what about the you know it's just like dude you know where's their support where's the where's the i mean $1,200 $1,200 check. A lot of these guys don't, you know, they don't exist in the normal realm. They're not, they're, of course they're paying their taxes, but I, you know, like for me, for instance, um, I don't get a ta- I don't receive money from the government in the form of tax refunds. I pay taxes. So I, I went on the site and I'm like, where's my check? <laughs> just like that is unavailable. You know, they're like, they don't have your bank account. They don't, you know, I own multiple businesses. So some of my tax returns haven't been processed, even though they're filed. And I'm just sitting here going like, well, fuck. So I'm just fucked. And I bet you all these other guys that work for us are fucked too, because they're all in weird situations. They're all 1099 and weird and under the table and cash. And, you know, and it's just, wow. You know, it's just really, really scary and sad. I mean, it's it's you're actually gambling with with your life right now. I mean, you yeah. have you have to book these show dates. You don't know if yeah. they're still if they're going to go on, but there's only so many dates available. There's only so many venues, and you're not the only band that's waiting to book some stuff. So everyone's going to be fighting to get real estate at, yeah. at a venue. Yep, yeah. yeah, that's for sure. That's for sure. It's it's going to be. I think that's why we're just keeping our dates. And, um, and then we'll just see and just, we'll hope, you know, and I think the, the, the scariest thing will be if, uh, you know, if California stays so locked down. Um, I mean, we've had really, uh, not a, not the worst experience with this coronavirus. And I'm sure they'll claim it's because that it, it's because we locked it down so hard. That's always going to be the, the claim, but there's, there's instances popping up, you know, like Sweden that, you know, everything's kind of leveling out to be about the same effect of not locking down. <laughs> like, you sit here and you go, oh, man. But, you know, you've got certain states like, you know, New York where it was really bad. I wouldn't blame them for being locked down for longer. But does that mean we can't play in Brooklyn? Does that mean, you know, the five shows that we have in uh, in, in California, we can't do those? I mean, because that would, that, would, that would destroy a tour, you know. That would be six six shows off the, off the tour. I mean, that that right there could be the profit. You know, it's like pretty bad. Now you mentioned earlier that you can't see bigger shows happening for a while. You know, stadiums, arenas, things like that. Now, do you think those bands are going to start doing club shows? Um, you know, I don't know. That's a good question. I I, I wonder how you know, profitable that can be for those bands because they're just so scaled. Um, you know, it's kind of tough sometimes for really, really big bands to turn down the volume. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, I know that it was tough for me and Amir to go from the height of Orgy 
and then try to figure out how to do Julian K on an indie level um, and and not have, you know, two tour buses and more crew than there was in the band. And, and it wasn't because we're stupid or egotistical. We just didn't, you know, we were just kind of like, yeah, we need all this stuff to make a show. <laughs> you, know, it's like, you know, and then to redo the model um, to be able to do it almost with, you know, with big skin and bones, you know, uh, type of operation and, and be able to come out profitable is a, is a big deal. Um, I don't know. You know, I don't know. Uh, if these big bands are really, you know, the kind of money these guys are used to getting, the, um, you know, they do look at their, a lot of times they look at their touring company as a family. You know, they don't want to give up on these, these guys that they know are out of work too. Um, these guys all count on being part of that, but you know, I, I don't know. They might have no choice but to scale down and do something. I just, I just don't know. I mean, maybe a lot of the big ones are big enough to just kind of go like, okay, well, we don't tour this year. Next year, it'd be like we're doing an album. You know, I mean, they, they make money. So, you know, and, and you know, a lot of the higher end, um, you know, guys that are on the road, um, you know, they make, you know, you know, three thousand plus dollars a week. So if they're if they're if they're you know careful, they they should have some money. You know, it's definitely the the lower down on the rung scale that I'm a little more worried about. You know, it's like the more of the indies like us, where if we don't go do this, you know, that that's it. There's not there's not an extra hundred grand in the bank that I can just you know live off of. And you know, our royalties are 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 good, and I'm grateful for them. I mean, I you know from Corn to Orgy to Dead by Sunrise to Julian K, and it's all really great. Um, but it's not you know it doesn't it's not enough to pay, it's not enough to pay a mortgage every month. You know. Now, one thing I, I've noticed on speaking of that aspect is that uh, yesterday Vince Neil just announced solo shows that are say almost the same dates as the uh, the Motley Crue shows. I mean, he's he's playing in my neck of the woods on a day off, and he's nowhere near where the Motley Crue show is the day before. Yeah, that's that that's called access to a jet. Yeah. Right. Yep. Yep. And when you're at that level at a Lincoln Park, Metallica, Motley Crue level a lot of these guys um there's buses involved but they they do just a lot of private you know depeche mode all that kind of stuff um it's it's um they're they're out the back door um before the shows before one fan has left the building they're on a jet and then they go they go back to whatever hotel room that they're, that they're staring at staying at they it's called hubby and so what you do is you a lot of times they'll stay in one hotel in one city and they'll just fly out every day to the shows and so when you've got that level of money to spend on that kind of stuff, that's how you can pull off those logistic maneuvers. You know what I mean? I've, I've, I know from personal experience. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you know, a lot of bands will, instead of touring, they'll maybe even bring their family and if you put them in one hotel and you kind of live there. Maybe it's Boston, let's say, or maybe it's Paris and you stay in Paris and you fly to each show and that's how you do it. And you just, you have a private car take you, you know, to the private airport and then you drive it out and you drive it back in. It becomes really, really easy. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like just going to work, um, you know, for, you know, six hours a day. <laughs> now let's, let's talk about the, the album, uh, Harmonic Disruptor. I mean, how frustrating was that to have everything all set up and then just, you even had to push back. I mean, the album just got released, uh, today, yesterday. Uh, no, it got released on the 17th, so, uh, last week, last Friday. Um, it, yeah, it was definitely frustrating and scary. Um, you know, we did a lot of work and, and emotion and blood into that album. You know, after, after Chester passed, you know, it, it became, it took on a whole new meaning and, and it was a very difficult album to do. Um, it was just very hard on me. Um, there was a lot of, you know, vocal sessions that just ended in, or, you know, we're interrupted by just breaking down and crying, you know, all of us, because the songs very much started becoming about him. And, and I even, you know, started screaming on some of the songs and, it, and I realized that I'm using techniques that he taught me and it sort of sounds like him a little bit. And, and it's very emotional, very, very, very hard. And, um, and, you know, you want that to have like a great chance to see the light of day. And, um, that's that it's hard you know but 
we're happy that the response has been really good. Our fans really like it. Um, we finally started getting added to some playlists on Spotify, you know, which is, you know, some really big lists, which is really good because that's kind of like the modern equivalent of getting added to radio. Um, and if more of that happens, I mean, then that's, that's really, really cool. So I, I, I'm, I'm bummed that the, that it ended up getting dragged out. <laughs> And we had to release it when we expected to be on tour, or in we're not. <clears throat> but I'm happy. I'm happy that it's being received the way it is. We're getting a lot of press from it. People are responding really well to it. I even saw it uh, when Harmonic Disruptor was posted on Blabbermouth, which is normally where you get shredded for everything, right? Um, unless you're Corey Taylor. Um, this, I read the comments, and there was actually a couple comments that were like, you know what, this is actually not that bad. This is pretty good industrial music. <laughs> and I was like, fuck, man, even these fucking haters like it. So I think we have a really good record. It's really focused. I'm, I'm really happy with it. And I, I hope that, um, you know, I hope that we get a chance to really get it the push that it that it deserves. I mean, judging from the amount of interviews and cool stuff I'm getting here at home, I mean, it's 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 great. You know, now with Edema, I was reading that you guys were going to have music to go with the tour. You guys still have new music coming out. Well, interestingly enough, we actually uh, we have songs that we're writing and working on. But this whole time we were all planning on, you know, I was going to do Julian K, Edema, Julian K. So I was going to tour almost the entire year. And. We were going to basically, the only new music was going to be Harmonic Disruptor, and there was really no time to make new edema. We were just going to write. Um, given what happened, we started writing more. We actually ended up getting offered a record deal, which we may or may not do. Um, and I'm not going to say with you or anything, but that was really interesting that since I joined the band and we toured and, every, and it went over really well, that, you know, the word spread and, and we got offered like a legit deal. <laughs> That's cool. So... That means that Edema has definitely got demand for an album. And so we're, we're going to be doing some, some stuff. Uh, right now we're just trying to figure out, do we want to do it at, you know, kind of in an independent way? Do we want to record two songs and then see what labels are interested if we don't want to you know, do all the work um, and pay for the whole thing? Um, and that's kind of that's where we're at. And, and we've, caught, we've got um, the rest of this month and May, and then it's June when we're supposed to be touring. So I give it a 50-50 of whether or not that's going to happen, right? Um, I'm not supposed to say that, by the way. I think I'm contractually obligated to not say that. <laughs> but all I can say is that all I can say is that if there's shows, we'll be there. We're not we're not fucking fucking any shows off. But you know, I just don't know what's going to happen. Um, if that goes away, I would say there's definitely going to be some new edema. <laughs> because we're going to fill the time recording. We're going to record New Julian K and New Edema. We're just going to get ahead of all of it. You know, we're not, we're not going to let this just knock us out of, out of fucking orbit. You know, we're just not. Now, now how does that work now uh, with recording during this pandemic? I mean, with everything closed, uh, are you guys able to get together? Are you guys doing it over uh, Zoom or any shit like that? Um, we do like, we basically do the Julian K technique, which is, um, you know, one of our members lives in Canada and, um, two of them live in San Diego and Amir and I are neighbors in the same neighborhood, which is pretty funny. It's a very LA story. Um, I own a recording studio and Amir owns a recording studio. He, his is set up more for mixing and electronics and mine is a little bit bigger and set up for collaboration. And it's at our houses, but they're, they're separate. You know, they're studios. It's not like I have a bedroom that's like got a computer in it. I have a fucking legitimate recording studio. Um, and, uh, I'm, I'm in there right now. So I just walked in and basically, um, we use Dropbox and we collaborate, uh, almost in real time, you know, sharing ideas, so on and so forth in Dropbox. And we do that anyways, even, even before, uh, even before COVID-19. Um, and then we get together. So then we, once we go, okay, we have some ideas, um, then we get everyone up to my studio or we get some like the key, some, some of the key people that maybe wrote a certain idea. We'll get them together. And then we start recording and writing. We'll, we'll, we'll jam it out, do whatever we've got to do. Um, and that's kind of that's kind of how we did everything. So we did Dead by Sunrise. That's how we've done all the Julian K albums. That's probably how we'll end up doing Edema. The only difference with Edema is that 
Edema is a real rock band. Like they're they're five, they're four guys in this band. It's the original band. They have, they kind of need to get in a room and play it. Like after we kind of write it, we can write it, you know, via computer and recorder ideas. But then you got to get together and play it. So that would be the only difference with Edema. So that doesn't mean that we we can't figure out another way to do it. Like we could get together in my studio and maybe have drum pads and stuff to work out songs. Um, and that could be a workaround, but that's something we're talking about right now. Right now I'm getting like a bunch of, you know, they're getting together at Mike's in Bakersfield and, you know, every Wednesday and, and sending me ideas that they wrote and they're, they're basically kind of putting all this stuff together. And then I'm kind of coming up with vocal ideas and then I add it, put it in the Dropbox and we all look at it and listen to it. And Amir and I are, we see each other every day. So Amir's going to produce the album. So, you know, it's just kind of like one of those things that we're just going to work it into the workflow of whatever time is available and whatever, you know, we'll be jumping back and forth between Julian Kay and Edema. Now, you mentioned that one of your members live in Canada. Let's say that, you know, the states here are opening up slowly. Mm -hmm. What if the border's still closed? Oh, I, we expect it. Yeah. We're, we're just going to have to... Um, we're just going to have to do what we're doing and do this remote type of working. So he has a studio up there as well. So basically, if we record something in Pro Tools, we save it in Dropbox, and then he can open up the file exactly the way, exactly as if he was in the same room with us. So we, we actually do a ton of work all year like that. We're, we're, we're pretty adept at remotely working together. So in that way, it's not that different. We do need to get together. It's good to have us all in one room. Um, that's definitely helpful. But, you know, it's, it, we can make it. We can figure it out by Amir and I working and then sending it up to Fu in Canada and him doing, you know, him opening it up on Pro Tools and having it be the exact session that we just did and then him doing his stuff to it. And that's, that's not an unusual workflow. It's just we typically would have liked him to come down once a month for like, you know, five to ten days. Now, what I'm talking about is when the tour starts up, what if the border's still closed? Oh, yeah, then, then it's closed. Then I mean, is he, all, is he able to, to come here? Oh, no, no, no. He hasn't, he hasn't been playing with his wife. Oh, okay. Yeah, so we're, we're kind of – Julian Kay essentially is Amir and I who founded the band. And Fu, who's been working with us from the orgy days. And at some point, Fu became a member of the band and toured with us, but then ended up, you know, he took care of his mom, you know, in her last days for a few years. You know, he went moved back up to Canada, still worked with us and all that kind of stuff. And when we started really becoming a band that could really tour again and, and, and make a living doing that, like, uh, it, it really was Amir and I putting together, you know, we started working with Biddy, uh, Cobra and uh, Alex, Alex Gonzalez, who are the guys that we've been touring with and um, working with on Harmonic Disruptor. So we, we kind of put together like a different touring band of guys that we're still working with and recording with. And that's been sort of the story of the band since its inception. You know, we work with a pretty large group of creatives from, you know, Brandon Belsky to Eli James, Eric Stoffel, um, Galen Whaling, Frank Zumo, who's in Sum 41 now. I mean, there's all these different people that we work with, Sue, who's, you know, more of a core member. Um, uh, Elias Rodriguez, who's going to go out and play drums on this, on this coming tour, which is our original drummer. So it's always been kind of like a project and Amir and I are sort of like the core of, and we drive and kind of program and create the, you know, what it's going to be. And then we have a, a group of people that we work with. And sometimes they tour with us, sometimes they don't. Like right now, who is, is is doing work with Spotify and work with us, so he's not really looking to go out and tour, and that's and that's totally okay. Now, when when things start going up, like uh, I'm in I'm in New York, so I know you're in California. Oh, wow. New York, it's you know we're on we're on lockdown, lockdown here, man. Like <laughs> it's uh it's a little scary. Now, are you going to? do international shows or are you only going to focus on the states i mean are you going to be leery uh, about all the certain places yeah i'm not i'm not booking anything outside of the u.s right now i think it's too i think that's that that takes the risk level to a another 
until the until the world kind of feels like we've got this like under control, I wouldn't be booking. I wouldn't be booking European shows right now, or I I, I wouldn't want to do that. I mean, until we really really know. I mean, at least in the states, we can you know we can drive home. <laughs> exactly. I was going to say. I mean, if you get locked, you know, if things get locked down here again, at least you can get to your house. I mean, if you're over in the UK or Italy or any, you know, who knows? You know, you could be locked in there. Yeah, totally. And that would be super bad. Yeah. Now, now for the the fans that want to follow up, they want to purchase some merchandise. They want to go to the Patreon. They want to. Get the album. What's the best route? What do they got? What do they do? Uh, JulianK.com is where you can get any merchandise, albums, um, vinyl, all that kind of stuff. Patreon, you just go to Julian K. And Patreon is basically direct access to us. We do streaming um, interactive content. We do um, technical chats where we like literally kind of show people how we're doing what we're doing. We do, um, I do like a once a month song breakdown, like what the lyrics mean and what it, and it's interactive so people can talk to me about it. They can ask me what I'm thinking when I wrote this song. Um, and we do, uh, we do in every other month, we let the fans vote on a cover that Amir and I play acoustically. And so they get to kind of have a private live stream of us doing a really cool cover. Um, yeah, I think it's going to be called, it's going to be Duran Duran's Come Undone, um, is what they voted in. And uh, we do a lot of stuff like that. There's a private chat room that's only for our patrons, and we get on there and talk with people. So there's a lot of cool stuff. And at the higher levels, you even get like two free tickets. You get complimentary music. You get there's there's a lot of cool stuff. You get access to um, what I call alternate universe, and that's where you get music and stuff that never really made it to prime time, but it's still cool. And so it lives in an alternate universe, and you get to hear it. But it's stuff we'll never release. Uh, just, awesome. just for our patrons. Yes, there's a lot of cool stuff, and it's and it's we're we're building it as we go because with Patreon you have to launch it first before you can start programming it. So that was a little different for us. We were used to like getting it all together and then launching it, but it's all cool. The fans came, they came in droves. It, it's it's and, and they came in so high. I mean, we have so many people at the hundred and five hundred dollar level. It's incredible, and they just want to fucking help. They just want to like be part of it. So even at the five hundred dollar level, I do a really cool thing where I'm like, like we had one person who wrote a book, and and I I, I made the five hundred dollar level basically for like sponsors. Like if you want me to feature your product or do something with it and talk about it or even put your picture up on the on the shelves in our studio so that you're in all of our streaming stuff, we'll do that. It's just a fun cool thing. Well, it turned out people actually had things they wanted to promote, and they did it. So, and because they wanted to support us too. So it's a fucking super cool thing. I didn't know it would be this cool and this fun. I didn't know. <laughs> I thought it might be stupid. No one would care, but it's totally cool. Um, and then, um, every DSP, Apple, Spotify, um, everything, everything has the, has the, uh, has the music, of course, if you don't want to get it on our, if you want to get it digitally, we have a pan camp. We have everything. So I, I could see fans flocking to that kind of interaction right now. I mean, there's no new movies, there's no new TV yep. shows, there's there's nothing. So yep. right now, the only thing you have is actual live entertainment that's virtual, but it's still you know live, yep. so to speak. Yeah, totally, totally. It, it's worked out really, really well. So, and we we have yet to really, really start up the whole. You know, once I get the studio wired up with the Black Magic cameras, I, you know, I cut a deal with them. Uh, and they're super supportive. Um, so we're going to have some high quality, like HD streaming content. And I had this idea for making a, a channel based off of, you know, Harmonic Disruptor, JKHD, but JKHD TV. And we would do this kind of working into Patreon as this kind of regular thing that we're doing where we're streaming us working. Um, you know, maybe we do something with Twitch, but there's, you know, my brain's going kind of wild with thing, ways that we can interact with our fans and give fans content. Um, and things that they enjoy, you know, while they're fucking locked up. And the cool thing is that it's been working so well that even after the lockup ends, we can still do this stuff. You know, we'll still have that support and that subscription service type of level of support. And that can become kind of like a base income for the band so that we don't fucking go out of business. <laughs> you know what I mean? So... 
But I mean, as of right now, you are literally writing history. I mean, you're giving your fans something to look forward to. You're keeping busy yourself. You change, yeah. change yeah, we're, we're done. trying. No. Absolutely, we're we're trying. Now, if uh, are your restaurants still open for to goes, or how does that work? Uh, two of them are open. Uh, to go, uh, you know, they're barely hanging on. The other two, we tried to go, but they're you know cafes that are based on social, like hanging out and being well, around. Right. Um, we just never were geared up. We're not drive throughs you know, um, and it just didn't make any sense. There's a there's a point in restaurants, uh, especially that labor and cost of goods. If you don't have a certain amount of sales you end up creating a bigger hole than if you did nothing. So we've had to hopefully temporarily close. Um, you know, and really, it's a really scary and sad thing because if we don't get some of these vaunted government loans, you know, this will turn into bankruptcies. You know, and I, I don't know, is there going to be a temporary change to bankruptcy law because of COVID-19? Like, hey, man, you're fucked, but you didn't cause it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, is there going to be, you know, I don't know. These are big, big questions because there's going to be a lot of people that, I mean, swingers in L.A., swingers is closed permanently. They they closed in two weeks. That That's how difficult it is for restaurants that, that if you can't flip it around and turn into like a market or something, which one of my restaurants kind of flipped this, this script and they're doing like these really cool to-go packages of, marinated meats and homemade tortillas and rice and beans and um, all their unique homemade sauces. And it can last you for a few days. And they're selling it for like 50 bucks and they're, they're selling really well, but you know, it doesn't, it doesn't have the margin or create the business of having a full bar with everyone ordering cocktails. You know what I mean? It's just not, you know, it, it's, it's bringing in some money, but you know, you're walking a tightrope. <laughs> you know, it's really hard. It's really hard. Now, are you guys allowed to sell uh, alcohol to go there in New York? You're you're allowed to do that. We are temporarily right now. Yeah, yeah, we are. Right. And 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 Lola's my my restaurant. Lola Gaspar is is doing just that. They're they're kind of doing everything. And Lola's is in kind of a good situation in the way that the you know the head chef, my partner, um, he he's in there cooking. <laughs> you know, my other partner, his brother. Um, is is in there kind of you know man it's it's a lot of the partners in there working, whereas you know at my other restaurants where I have employees running the whole thing, it, it doesn't you know I can't go in there and cook all day and fucking make to go orders and everything I just that's not my skill set, um you know so it's just there's not really a way and all all restaurants are different you know what I mean if it's a mom and pop and mom and pop want to go in and work for free, no. I just... Dude, I, I feel bad for you. I mean, you're totally fucked on all levels. I mean, from being a musician to being a restaurateur, I mean, this is something you could never have prepared for. Nope. Nope. And, and yeah, and, it, and it's pretty scary, you know, and you see the money go out and, and fucking Shake Shack eats like $10 million. I mean, thank God they gave it back. But they have $100 million on, you know, cash on hand. You know, Ruth's Chris, I would be very surprised if they didn't have cash on hand. They're a major brand. You know, but it's like that right there, that was 30 mil. So it's like sprinkle that. I mean, you know, 90 grand <laughs> is what like places like ours would need, you know, to, to, to get going again, like to start it back up and rehire everyone and buy new food. And we're going to owe rent. You're going to owe everything. I mean, it's, it's fucking crazy. It took me, um, it took me five days of being on the phone 10 hours a day just to like negotiate, just to basically call everyone involved in, in what creates our business. To basically call them and say, hey man, um, we're, we're all fucked. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, you know, I just want to let you know that I am equally like, you're probably getting this call, you know, a hundred times a day right now. I'm just telling you that we have no money. There's nothing, and we're closed. So we're just going to have to talk afterwards. <laughs> so hold back on the lawsuits. You know, all that kind of stuff. And so far, so far so good. But, you know, 
that's a, again another unintended consequence is when you owe people money and you owe vendors money and you owe creditors money and you owe landlords money and this thing passes. At some point, some way, shape, or form, you have to pay. And if restaurants are half capacity, I call that fuck loads of lawsuits. Fuck loads of lawsuits because they sue. They'll sue. You know, and it's just, I fucking don't know. I'm not hearing anything smart <laughs> you know, from anyone regarding, like, man, we may have to kind of change the rules in general to kind of allow everyone to get along and get out of this mess because. You know, I, you know, the problem is a lot of people in government don't understand business at, at all. They've never run a business. They don't know what, you know, 5% margins truly mean. They don't understand that. Um, they just spend money that's taken from businesses and people. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, it's scary. You know, their, their solutions, um, uh, I mean, say what you want about the president, and I don't care if anyone supports him or doesn't, and I didn't vote for him, and I also didn't vote for Hillary, so I don't care. I'm, I guess I'm kind of agnostic. I'm, I'm a libertarian. But, I mean, he at least his words had the, you know, it, it definitely, that, that was what we needed, but when it got through the government, it certainly didn't seem to happen. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like, fuck. I mean, it's like, yeah, we're going to take care of all the 1099 people. We're going to... You know, we got to do this. The, the workers, the small businesses, we've got to help the small businesses. And all I see is small businesses just getting fucking closed left and right, you know. And I, and I, I really thought there'd be a focus on the 1099 people and the, um, and the restaurants, like the small independent restaurants like ours, because we do a, a, a massive amount of employing. Right. I mean, you put us all, you put us all together and we're as big as Cheesecake Factory and Shake Shack and all those, those brands. We're just a bunch of indies. So, you know, we're the ones that all need like a quick, you know, 10, 20, 30, $40,000 cash infusion. You know, we don't need 10 million. We need, you know, we just need it directly right now <laughs> so that we can get, so we can help put a plan together to come out of this. You know what I mean? And, and I, that has not happened. No, nah, it's got to be very frustrating on your end. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're, you're getting pulled in every every level possible, and it's just, uh, you know, I give you credit for for, for continuing to do what you yeah. do, man. I, I picked some really smart uh, businesses, right? Music and restaurants. <laughs> 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 well, I uh, I appreciate your time. I'm looking forward to. Uh, Hopefully getting to see you, man. I mean, I, I see some of your dates are in my neck of the woods, so uh, concerts are going to be there, you know. Concerts are going to happen. I'm definitely going to leave the house one way or another. Yeah, I, I, I hope so, and I can't wait. I hope so. And uh, so if they want to go to the tour dates, they, wanna, they, they want to uh, purchase tickets, meet and greets, they can go right to Gita Julian K or Edema. Yes. Yeah, we're going to be, uh, we have, we have both tours are, are all, both dates are booked and, and birthday massacre, June K has been rebooked. So all these venues accepted the booking. So I think everyone's planning on doing some shows. So we'll, we'll have to see. Cool, man. All right. I appreciate your time. It's been great talking to you and I wish you the best of luck. Thank you so much, my friend. Nice to meet you. And I hope to see you in uh, New York. Definitely, man. Take care. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.